Have you ever wondered what eventually happened to the apostles, Paul, and other New Testament followers of Christ? Today's program features Brian Litvin, professor of theology at Moody Bible Institute and author. He will share about his new book, After Acts, exploring the lives and legends of the apostles. Skillfully researched and clearly written, After Acts is as accurate as it is engaging. We hope that you will be encouraged as you hear how the foundation of the church was established by these men and women who followed Jesus. Stay tuned. Hi friends, welcome to the Everlasting Love Program. I'm your host, Barbara Karpuzian, and I'm so glad that you decided to join us. And we want you to know that God loves you with an everlasting love. It doesn't matter what your background is, what struggles and challenges that you may have faced, the ups, the downs, God loves you with an everlasting love. You know, his word says that he loved the world so much that he was willing to come to this world. He came, Jesus Christ came into the world, God's only son, that he was willing to die for you and to set you free. And then he rose again on the third day in order that we would have life and we would be able to spend that life with him eternally. You know, during the course of the program, you'll see some information pop up on the screen. Please visit our Facebook page, uh, check out our YouTube channel. You'll find a lot more inspiring uh, stories, testimonials. Um, you'll hear uh, uh, about some great books um, that have been um, written by some of the different authors that have been on our program. Also, if you're looking for a good church, if there's somebody that you would like um, to pray with you, or you have, a, you have a prayer request, please feel free to reach out to us and we will get back with you. I wanted to share a scripture that I feel is very pertinent to our program today. Um, and that scripture comes from 2 Timothy, uh, and it's verse two, it's chap, it's 2 Timothy, verse 2, um, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, and it says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. What I like about today's show is it's not just about someone's story, but it's, a, it's, a, it's really about a great book called After Acts exploring the lives and legends of the apostles. And you know, we, we need to always have a reason for the hope that lies within us. We, we really need to be studying. Any, anyone out there um, who has gone to school or is, is, you know, uh, wants to have a career, you know that you've ha you have to study, right? And as believers, we also need to study. We need to know what God's Word says. And so um, on, a, uh, on the program with us today is Brian Litvin, and he is the author of this book, After Acts, um, exploring the lives and legends of the apostle. And uh, we're so glad that he's uh, decided to join us. He is a past professor uh, at, at Moody and um, obviously an author. And I know he uh, continues to work for Moody. He works for Moody Press now, mm -hmm. uh, editing. Uh, yes. So yes. Uh, welcome to the program, Brian. It's great to uh, be here, Barbara. Thank you so much for having me. Well, before we get into this book, uh, which I have read and, um, and really, really enjoyed because right. this is information, having been a believer for a long time, mm -hmm. th some of this is new information. Yep. Right. And you break it down in a way, I think, that uh, is, is uh, real easy. It's real easy reading. Yeah. Um, anyone can pick it up and understand. And I love how you have some report cards after each uh, <laughs> <laughs> chapter. Yeah. 
So uh, before we do that, though, before we delve into the book, tell us a little bit about yourself. How yeah. did you become a believer? And you weren't always a Chicagoan no. either. That's right. Um, I, I trusted Christ at an early age, so I don't have much of a memory of when I wasn't saved. I have some vague memories of going with the Sunday school teacher when I was a little boy and hearing the gospel message. Maybe I was four or five or six. My dad was a seminary professor and he would sometimes go around and preach in different churches. And so because I was at a church that I didn't know everybody, I didn't want to go off with the Sunday school teacher and maybe pray uh, with him, but there in my... That's really funny. <laughs> yeah, you know how that is. You're, you're visiting, right? I mean, churches should make people feel welcome, and they probably did, but I just didn't want to, um, you know, go by myself. So I trusted Christ, and, and it's been a journey with the Lord ever since, for sure. Wow, I love that. So just stayed on track with <laughs> him all of these years, went to school, went to college. Yep. I'm, I'm not a perfect man, but I, I didn't have the proverbial phase of rebellion or something like that. I walked with the Lord as best as I could, ups and downs, as you know, how the Christian mm -hmm, life is, sure. two steps forward, one step back. But uh, yeah, I went off to college. My, my dad uh, transitioned to, to being a full-time pastor, so I was the pastor's kid during my high school years in Tennessee, and then went off to the big university, you know, maybe you've had those kind of experiences mm -hmm. or the viewership certainly maybe has been that young person that goes off to college and has to stand for Christ. And it's difficult, but you do, and you navigate those waters. It seems like it's getting harder every year, yes. isn't it? Yes, sure, sure. Uh, in yes. that setting. And uh, after that, I got married to my beloved bride, Carolyn. We were high school sweethearts, and uh, we have... Um, you should be writing a book about this, <laughs> Brian. <laughs> Well, I have written some novels that have romantic uh, lines in them, of course, but it's not patterned off of any actual people. But uh, maybe I will someday. That would be, that'd be great. Because we, we often hear about the prodigal, right? Or yeah. we often hear about the, 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 the person who's, um, you know, done all of these yeah, things in their yeah. life that they regret yeah. and uh, challenges that they've faced, right. pain, all of this. And then at some point they make a decision to accept Christ. Yeah. But it, I think it's just as beautiful yeah. to hear the story of someone who said, yeah, I accepted the, I accepted the Lord as a little boy. Yeah. And it was real to me. Yeah, and was. yeah, I'm not a perfect man, uh, but I I decided that it was the right choice. And, and I've stayed with him all these yeah. years. Yeah. And I've experienced the, the fruit of, of walking yeah. with him all these yeah. years. No, I, I agree. And, and sometimes when people are giving their testimony, they feel compelled to kind of give the exciting testimony and how you hit the gutter and maybe those make for good stories. But as you say, it's better to, if you can, and if the Lord has this for you to be able to walk with him all your life. And I'm sure your viewers, there are some in both camps. That's right. There's some who have been in that gutter. That's right. And there's some who have never had that life experience. But God, as you said at the beginning, has an everlasting love mm -hmm. for the man lying there in the gutter and the person who has been a good little Christian boy all his life. The love of God mm -hmm. reaches to both of those people, yes. doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. So you got married. Yeah, we got married and headed off to seminary. So I, I knew that I wanted to serve the Lord somehow uh, full time. And so I went, went off and Carolyn came with me and we went to Dallas Seminary in Texas. And that was a great experience. And and then we had our two kids and, and went on, you know, went on from there to uh, to graduate school in Virginia. So did a Ph.D. in, in the ancient church. Mm -hmm. And that's where I began to get interested in not just the time of the New Testament, but the next generation. In fact, mm. I was in seminary and it kind of hit me. Well, what happened next? Mm. You know, you can read the book of Acts and that's sure. what, the, what it's about. Sure. Is you can read the book of Acts and you come to Acts 28. And I would often tell my students now that I'm a teacher, uh, in fact, sometimes I do this. I, I ask them to uh, turn in their Bibles to uh, Acts chapter 29. And I tell them <laughs> to raise their hand when they have it. And you'll get some extra credit. You'd be surprised how, how many, many students raise raise their, their hand. hand. <laughs> and I say, what Bible do you have? There's not an Acts 20. Get rid of it. <laughs> Get rid of it because it's probably a, a heresy. Yeah. But, but of course, as, it, as you think about it, the story doesn't end. Acts 28 brings to an end the biblical record of the apostles yeah. and the disciples. 
but then the question is, what what happened? What to happens? Next? Yeah. And it was th that was the kind of thing I was studying in my grad school. So, be, so we 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 definitely are going to get into yeah, the great. the substance of this book and unpack it. Yeah. Um, but you know, I loved when you said. Um, you know, I knew I wanted to do something mm. for Christ. Yeah. You know, what what compelled yeah. you? Or what what I, I'm sure if we had a bunch of believers in the yeah. room, we could we could say you know ask yeah. that question. Yeah. What? But what compels yeah. one to want to do something for God? Yeah, and specifically Jesus, right? Mm. That's a great uh, that's a great question. That's it, your next book. <laughs> yeah. no, that I would keep be putting a great all these book. books. <laughs> Maybe we should co-write it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I think we have there you book go. In I work for a publisher now. I can make it happen. <laughs> Um, but I mean, you know, there's kind of a core thing to that, which is God's love for you and for me and for, for those that are touched by God's love. And then you're, you're compelled to answer your question, to turn that back and say, Lord, you've given so much for me. What can I do for you? And that doesn't always look like full-time ministry. Yes, I get that. That's right. You can mm -hmm. be a plumber or you can be a surgeon or yes. you can be a car salesman or whatever and be serving God mm -hmm. very faithfully. In fact, if we don't have believers in those environments, that's right. how do you that's witness right. to people? Mm -hmm. Like I'm around Christians all the time because I work for Moody. Yes. So I don't usually witness at work because yeah. they already know the Lord. But so there's many different professions that you can do that. But, but the love of God compels you. And I just found through my seminary years and then on through my PhD years that I had a, a, a gift and a desire and a love for teaching. And I wanted to serve in that way. And a job was open at Moody Bible Institute. And for 16 years, I was a professor there. And what a beautiful honor it was to serve the Lord in that way. And I found very much over those years that I love students. And so that's what kept me going was the energy of young people learning yes. and growing in their faith. Yes. Well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a retired educator, so oh, yeah. I, uh, I, I, I understand that passion and that we fist energy bump? Fist from bump? where we are, yeah, right? right? Yeah, mm -hmm. fist bump. <laughs> I, I love it. Um, well, thank you for sharing that because yeah. uh, I think that I think it's important for folks that are listening to understand that what makes Christianity different yeah. from every other belief system yeah. is that he loves us first mm. and that because of that love we are compelled yeah. to 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 serve him um, so many other religious uh, you know systems out there if you yeah. will um, they have to do something That's right. to get his love That's right. but he loved us while That's right. we were yet sinners That's right. and I won't preach but I just wanted to <laughs> I think I would like to hear you preach sometime, <laughs> yeah, okay. actually from what I've seen so far that would be a great sermon there you go <laughs> there you go <laughs> so I, let's talk about this book, uh, okay. Simple Reading, um, After Acts, Exploring the Lives and Legends of the Apostles. Yeah. And this came at a right time for me because I actually just got done um, not too long ago reading through the book of yeah, Acts, such yeah. a fabulous yeah. book. Yeah. And I know that you indicate in here too if, if, that we thought Luke wrote the book of Acts. Yes. Um, did he write the book of Acts? I think that, is, I mean, so there would be some scholars, maybe not conservative Bible-believing scholars who might disagree with that, but many would say that, yes, Luke uh, wrote, because he mentions at the beginning his previous volume, which is his gospel, and then Acts, but clearly they, they were meant to go together and were a kind of two-volume work. So I, I think that he did, and there would be then a question of exactly when did that happen. Okay, yeah. all right. Because I thought you gave it like an A minus or an maybe a B plus or yeah. something like that. Well, you know what I do with those report cards that you mentioned earlier is, you know, the, th the thing about being a historian or being one who studies these texts and sources is that sometimes they're conflicting. And so it's not open and shut, cut and dried. You're sort of weighing, this counts for more, this counts for less, this is better evidence, this is not. And then you come down on certain things like that, did Luke write Acts? that you say, here's here's my best guess, and the report card was meant to say, this one's a strong. Yes. I really think that's true, or this one's not a strong. Now, the one place I, I know for sure is if the scripture says it. Right. Then that's I'm right. not a historian. That's right. Then I'm that's a Christian right. obeying the word of God. Mm -hmm. But if it's not something directly stated in the Bible, you have to sift the evidence like a historian. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I think about people who will say, um, you know, one of the reasons why they don't, 
think the Bible is a, you know, is a true book mm -hmm. um, is uh, because of some of this yeah. evidence yep. or, you know, the, the uh, well, I, I think the dating of manuscripts actually yep. Yep. proves to the Bible it to does. be it a does. true book. But what would you say to somebody? And I know that's not, you know, it's a little yeah. off topic, yeah. but because one of the, the one of the questions that I wanted, you know, to ask was about the importance for Christians to understand yes. church history yes. and to be able to, but to be able to, um, you know, even answer that question, yeah. right? The reliability yeah. of the scriptures. Yeah. You have to answer that question, Barbara, in, in sort of different ways for the Old Testament versus the New. But since we're talking about the Apostles, maybe we'll talk about the New Testament in that case. And, and what one finds is that critics will say that kind of thing. Oh, you can't trust it. It's been translated so many times. Who can even know? And, and if you don't know better, you kind of think that must be true. And mm -hmm. so I can disregard the book. Uh, or I just have to completely have faith only and not have any rational thought or reason. But the truth of the matter is that we have better manuscripts and attestation of what's in the New Testament than we do for really any other work of the mm -hmm. ancient world. So if you, if you do want to say, I don't trust it, well, then you better throw out Plato and right. all the philosophers right. and all the ancient histories and books that you've ever heard mm -hmm. of and just say, we don't know any of it, because those would be more difficult to trust than yes. the New Testament. Like the Iliad and the Odyssey. Yeah, exactly. Like Homer the, or something yeah. like mm -hmm. that. There's pretty few manuscripts of those in Greek and, and we have way more manuscripts. I mean, what we don't have for the Bible is the actual paper that sure. the Apostle Paul wrote on. Sure. It'd be kind of cool. Yeah. But no, we do would. have a lot of good evidence and scholars are able to reconstruct that text. So what I would say to the viewers is you can trust the Bible. Yes. Amen. You That's can right. open that book That's and right. say, thus saith the Lord. Yes. Not just from a faith perspective, but from a historian's perspective. And don't let people tell you otherwise. The Bible's reliable. Mm, that's great. And I know we could probably do a whole program just on that mm -hmm. um, to talk about the different 40 different authors, yeah. all yep. different walks yep. of life, yep. etc. cetera. Yep. But why do you think it's so important? I mean, you, so you, you wrote this book after Acts. Yeah. Why do you think it's so important for Christians to know about right. church history? Right. That's a that's a question that's that's near and dear to my heart, Barbara, and I'm I'm glad you asked. And I've thought about it for many years, not only in my studies, and then in my work as a professor, and even something that I believe now as I work for Moody Publishers. Um, I, I have been trying to tell my students for years. I'll tell your viewers. I'll tell you. I think Christians need to get a sense of their heritage in the faith, because today the world is so fractured and so broken into little pieces and we're isolated from each other and we don't really understand our connection to something greater and bigger. And maybe our churches, they change so quickly and we forget that we are part of something very ancient and very old and very consistent. And there has been this generation after generation after mm -hmm. generation that's been handing on that baton. And so when you get the baton, what, what, what do you feel? You feel, for mm -hmm. one thing, I better protect this. Yes. This thing is so holy and beautiful and valuable. Mm -hmm. I better not be the person that tarnishes it. I need to pass it on with the same depth that it was given to me. And it also gives you a sense of encouragement of the, the kind of beauty and, and, and largeness and grandeur of the church. Mm -hmm. And so I love to awaken Christians to say, you're not just part, uh, you are part, but you're not just part of a little community That's that right. comes on Sunday. That's right. You're part mm -hmm. of the whole church, mm -hmm. God's church to the ages. So why don't you get to know some of your forefathers and foremothers in the faith? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. Um, so, uh, I wanted to, I, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the, the beginning of the book too. Yeah. It, it, it's almost like a, a kind of like a glossary yeah. uh, of terms yeah. like orthodox versus yep. heretical yep. and liberal versus conservative. Yep. And we're not talking about, you know, politics, part po politics no. here. No. Um, why did you feel that it was important to include some of that yeah. language yeah. in here? Well, because... I think a lot of Christians, maybe they're baby Christians, or maybe they haven't had the chance to do all the fancy learning and go to seminary, and maybe the pastor knows it, but they don't. So I just thought, I've had that privilege to go to those schools and to study those things, so I want to talk to my fellow 
believers and hold them by the hand in a respectful way and say, let's, let's talk about these terms and maybe these are new. If I were asking you about your field, you'd have to teach me new things and your terminology, but here's my terminology and so it's part of your story too. So let's ask ourselves, what do we mean about these big words like orthodoxy and church fathers and mm -hmm. like who, who's that? Who are we talking about? And mm -hmm. what even is the word apostle? Yes. We kind of know what they were, but what does it mean? Yes. Apostello, to be sent out. Mm -hmm. So they were those that Jesus himself, the risen Christ, sent out. So it just seemed to me that before we could get into the meat of the topic, we need to, to get some of the same terminology and be sure. on the same playing field. Sure. So talk about the church fathers. Yeah. Who, who were they? Yeah. That, Why do we call them church fathers? Yeah, no, that's a yeah. great question. And, and, it, and we are talking about After Acts today, which uh, I've had the privilege of writing, but I actually wrote a book about that subject, too, okay. Okay. Called, called Getting to Know the Church Fathers. Okay. <laughs> so for that question, uh, someone could Google the term getting to know the church fathers, okay. and they'd probably find it or whatever. So it answers that. But in both that book and here, um, usually the term church fathers, and of course we'd be inclusive of females, so they're the church mothers okay, too. Okay. They didn't tend to write as much in okay. that world, so there's not as many writings, but there were important women together. That term means basically like when I said before about passing the baton, who did the apostles, we know who those were, right? They're in the Bible. People like Peter and Paul and James and John. Who did they pass the baton to? Who were the next Christians? in the ancient Roman Empire, so they're maybe not recorded in the Bible or in the book of Acts, but they lived and they breathed and they did leave some writings and they left an evidence on history. Who were they? So a lot of people think of the ancient church and they picture like the Christians thrown to the lions, mm -hmm. you know, that concept, sure, the sure. persecution. That's who we mean. The Christians who led and were the theologians and the leaders of those ancient house churches mm -hmm. and they, 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 withstood persecution they stood for Christ in the in the Roman Empire mm -hmm. and and passed the baton on to the next generation as well okay so church fathers yeah so I, I, I would like for you to uh, maybe talk a little bit about some of the pairs of terms that yeah. you okay. uh, mentioned at the beginning. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll maybe I'll go with the liberal and conservative, okay. yeah. um, and and maybe even before well maybe even before you do that. Okay. Um, I, I was thinking about um, I my um, I'm Middle Eastern and I grew okay. up in a Maronite background. Oh, yeah, sure. um, and I remember um, the priest, I was, you know, he was very close to our family, yeah. often talk about um, church tradition. Yes. And, and, and I felt there were times when that almost, that trumped, mm. right? Yes. And, yes. and you, you kind of touch on, uh, yes. on that in your yes. book. Um, you know, that kind of trumped even the Bible, yes. right? Yes. The writings right. Um, uh, right. of the apostles, the right. scripture. So t talk a little bit about that before yep. we look at some of the terms at the beginning. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question, Barbara. I'm so glad you raised it. And I think many of your viewers are going to have that same experience, maybe not in your tradition, but in other ones, other denominations. So if there are Catholics out there that are watching, if there are Greek Orthodox, uh, Assyrian Church, many different groups, they will be familiar with this idea of the ancient fathers and they will think of them as maybe saints. And um, to your point about scripture and tradition, yes, there are these other Christian groups uh, that often have a kind of equality between things that have been handed down through Mother Church and things that come from the Word of God. Mm. And so one of the distinctives of the Protestant and especially the evangelical Protestants, like born-again Christians, is that principle of sola scriptura, scripture yes. alone. Yes. And so what happened with Protestantism is we said, we can't take the history and the tradition and just whatever the priest says or whatever the Pope says or whatever these people, these those are mere humans. And we need to say God's inspired Bible is above. Right, it elevates. It is elevated above. Yes. Mm -hmm. But here's what happens, Barbara, is that then if you believe that, you might just say, well, then fine, I don't need any of that stuff. And what I've tried to do in my career and my teaching and books like this is to say, well, hang on. Okay, we, we're not going to put it up equal to Scripture, but 
we could still study those mm -hmm. traditions. Mm -hmm. They are those forefathers yes. and foremothers. Yes. Maybe we can learn from their wisdom. Mm -hmm. Maybe it can be sifted as historical evidence. And so a book like this, or studying the church fathers, is a way of maybe bringing and saying, they're not equal to scripture, but let's not throw the baby out yes. with the bathwater yes. either. Let's yeah. rediscover our ancient roots yes. in the ancient faith. Yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering what kind of what that happy medium yeah. is. And your book helps to kind of uh, close that yes. gap a yes. little bit. Yep. Um, yep. And, and yet not make them equal. Yeah. Right. Well, and I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking about Paul, and I could be off on this, but I'm thinking about Paul, because weren't there times when Paul said, this is what I say, yes. as opposed to something that was... I, I don't know what the right term yeah, is, like but Jesus it, said like, that Jesus like that. said. I mean, does that fit in here somewhere, or is that just, yeah? Yeah, no, I know the question you're yeah. asking. And, and so where you've got Paul, the Apostle Paul, saying it in the inspired scriptures, like in 1 Corinthians or in 2 Corinthians, I think we would say as theologians and as Christians and as pastors, well, the Holy Spirit was inspiring him then. Yes. So what he's referring to is Jesus didn't say something that I know of on this topic. Okay. It's not in the four Gospels. Okay. But I say to you, but I say to you with the authority of the Holy Spirit okay. that's inspiring me. Right. And so we take that as being equal to Jesus' word okay. because it's in the Bible. Okay. As soon as you go outside the New Testament, somebody who says, I think this you might trust them if they're wise, but they're not inspired. Sure, sure. And that's the so the in, the difference between inspiration and yes. tradition yes. here. Yes. Yes. Um, and I just I asked that because there might be some folks watching yeah. too who might be thinking yeah. that. So. I'm very respectful of church tradition. Yeah. Like a lot of born again Christians, just they just like say, that's just man's thoughts. Well, yeah. What if those men were wise? Yeah. So I'm very respectful of it, and I'm very respectful of Catholics and Orthodox who understand the importance of ancient roots, I just have to put God's word above, above it. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, doesn't he also say he honors his word yeah. above his name? Yeah. So that word is so powerful, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because I, whatever folks think about confirmation when I yep. grew up in the Catholic Church, yep. confirmation is really where I accepted hmm. Christ. And mm -hmm. that was one of the rituals yes. or perhaps one of the traditions mm -hmm. that was pa you know, hand mm -hmm. passed down. Mm -hmm. and, but and it's, it's interesting, there probably were many young people, might have been fourth or fifth grade, yep. uh, who didn't know what they were doing. Yep. But I, I can point back to mm -hmm. that as the moment mm -hmm. of my salvation. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of interesting, right? That God still used yeah, that tradition yeah. um, to, to bring salvation into and my life. And maybe you were, what, 12 or 13 something or something like, like that. that. And yeah. so you were at that age, so confirmation happens where you've got infant baptism. Yes. Yes. So then you're not aware because it happened when you were yeah. a baby, so you have to confirm it. Yep. And then that's an age where you are thinking, yes. well, I need to own this myself. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So liberal versus conservative. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we, yes, we are not talking politics yeah. on this program. <laughs> Prefer not to do that in, in today's day and age, <laughs> at least not today. But those terms can be used in addition to a political meaning to basically how you approach the Bible. And a liberal scholar is the kind of scholar that you would maybe find in universities, in religion departments, and they would look at the books of the Bible as flawed, as having just being man's writings. In fact, they probably wouldn't make much distinction between something that Paul wrote and one of the church fathers wrote because mm -hmm. they're just, oh, just ancient people. And if they take any, if they even take religious value from it, the religious value is just insofar as the person might have an insight. Mm -hmm. But a, a biblical conservative, which is what I am and is what Moody Bible Institute would be, and I think you would be, mm -hmm. is one who says, no, the 66 books of the Bible, we're going to take a conservative approach that those books are from God. And yes, they were written by men, and yes, they have historical background, and they use language that we can compare to other ancient Greek sources, so that's important, but we still believe it's inspired by God. Yes. And so like at Moody, we teach that the Bible is inerrant, that the writings have no errors at all. So it's only a biblical conservative who will do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, biblical liberals will say things like it has bad stuff in it, 
Mm. It has false things. It has incorrect things. It even has nefarious things, things that are harsh and terrible. And so they will malign the scriptures. Mm -hmm. But the conservative believes this is the book of God. Mm -hmm. What about somebody who says that there are contradictions? Where, where, where do you think that? Because there, pro there probably are some, but I know, and I know that there are some great, there's some uh, great books out there too that talk yeah. about yep. they're yep. not, they're, they are, there are contradictions, but they're, but they're still really yep. truth. Yep. But what would you say about someone who says, there are contradictions. Yeah. That's a good question too. So it all comes down to how you resolve the contradiction. If you say, it says here A, that contradicts B, therefore one of these has an error or is false, they, that person wouldn't be a conservative. Mm -hmm. If you say, yeah, there's some contradictions like James and Paul. James says, you're not justified by faith, but also by mm -hmm. works. Paul says, no, no, you're justified by faith alone, not by works. Uh, so that would seem like a contradiction, and maybe we'd say they're in tension with one another, but there's a way to see that James is talking about one thing and Paul is talking about mm -hmm. something else, and so in the end, they don't make a truth contradiction. Sure. And that's what a conservative believes. Okay. Yeah. All right, can I ask about another term, sure. the orthodoxy mm -hmm. or orthodox and yeah. heretical, Yeah. right? Yeah. Talk about those. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are kind of... In academic circles today, if you send your kids off to a public university and they take a religion class, you know, whoever, you will find that the professors don't like to talk about orthodoxy and heresy. So mm -hmm. what is orthodoxy? We know what an orthodontist is. Ortho means straight. An orthodontist has straight, makes straight teeth. Mm -hmm. Orthodoxy means straight belief, correct belief. So orthodoxy means right doctrine. Orthodoxy is what you want your pastor to have. Orthodoxy is what you want everlasting television to be all about. The truth, the right doctrine, to tell you this is what God says, this is correct doctrine. And then, of course, the opposite of that is heresy, false doctrines like ancient doctrines like Gnosticism or yeah. modern heresies as what well. What is Gnosticism? Talk about that too because yeah. I was going to ask you that as well. Okay, well, so Gnosticism comes from the word for knowledge. And there were ancient heretics who did not have right doctrine, they had false doctrine, they, they said they were Christians, they said that they believed in the message of Jesus, but they used false gospels, mm -hmm. like the so-called Gnostic gospels, or the Gospel of Thomas, and basically they said Jesus' death on the cross is irrelevant and horrific and doesn't do anything for salvation, and even his body wasn't even a real body, mm -hmm. it was fake, what really matters is his teaching, yeah. his mystical knowledge. Yeah. So salvation comes through mysticism and not through the cross of mm -hmm. Christ. So that's heresy. Yes. That's false doctrine. Yes. Okay, so um, let's kind of go into the book a little bit further and kind of unpack some of the different um, um, apostles yeah. that, you, that you looked at. Yeah. I, I, I would like to ask you who was the most exciting for yeah. you to work yeah. on, yeah. and and then I'm going to tell you the one the ones that I kind of um, enjoy. But I want to hear yeah. yours yeah. first. Yeah. What like what were some epiphanies for yeah, you yeah, and yeah. fun things? I mean, uh, the probably the apostle that I liked studying the most was Peter, and the reason for that is because with Peter. You don't. You have. You have so much about him because, as everybody knows, Peter is viewed by the Roman Catholic uh, Church as the first pope. And what you have is all in the city of Rome. You have Saint Peter's Basilica, which is over his grave, and maybe even his bones are underneath the altar. Yeah, is that his real grave? Do we know that, or it's it's a complex question? But okay. I think Saint, if you go to Vatican City today, yes, it's not and, Rome. and yeah, I've been there. You've been, been there, there. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you know what it is mm -hmm. to walk up that yep. aisle and yep. to see all that structure, and that altar, and what's down underneath it is layers of history. Is it his grave? Probably so. Okay. Um, now they have some bones underneath there, deep underground in plexiglass. Are those Peter? You know, Peter the fisherman. Are those his? bones, his relics, maybe. Okay. And it's a, it's a fascinating tale. So favorites, Peter was one of those. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what are some things you discovered about Peter in, in doing this? Yeah, yeah. Um, some, of what, some of what I just said, some of the tale of about his um, 
uh, bones and whether they're really there. Uh, Peter is, and on the cover of the book, it's a famous painting by Caravaggio where uh, he's crucified upside down. Yes. So a lot of people have heard right. that. So did that happen? So with the Roman Empire, we often picture Jesus' crucifixion. He's very straight and kind of, you know, they, we think the cross must always look like that. But it was, a, it was torture. It was impalement. They were just nailing you up on sticks in any way that would be horrible. And so there's plenty of testimony that, that humans were crucified upside down sometimes. So you have some early traditions about Peter, not in the Bible, but, but post-biblical traditions about Peter um, being crucified upside mm -hmm. down. So that's probably true. Now, what have you always heard is the reason for this? Right. He said that, right? Like he said, oh, I'm not even worthy to uh -huh. be crucified. So is that true? So right? that's, what, that's where you're maybe getting pious legend. Probably somebody remembered see seeing Peter crucified upside down. The, other, the early Christians would go and watch something like okay. that and pray and be sad. And uh, probably someone remembered that as an eyewitness testimony. But you, you weren't allowed to make requests. Hey, by the way, mm -hmm. I, I think I'd like to be upside down. And the soldier said, oh, of course, sir, we'll help you with that, sir. Mm -hmm. So probably that's a little bit later. That tradition doesn't come a little bit later that he made the request and that they honored it. So that maybe is where you have a little bit of pious legend creeping in. Okay. Yeah. So another that you um, that you really enjoyed, um, well, I'm sure you enjoyed writing about all of them and learning about all of them, yeah. but some others that really kind of stood out to you or interesting things you found out. And right. I know that you also use secular resources. Yes. And I think that's important for folks to know as well, right? right. There, are, there are other like history books out yep. there and other secular sources yep. that are out there yep. um, that contributed to yep. this. And as one should do, right? Because you, you can be very respectful of modern day professors that are historians and they might not be believers but that doesn't mean that they didn't find some good facts mm -hmm. or you can look at ancient texts that are not church texts so they're not the church fathers they're not necessarily christians but maybe some ancient writer like tacitus is giving us a source and he's telling us something and so one studies that and then also you have archaeology so you have texts as well as physical remains mm -hmm. so yeah as a historian you kind of you have to sift all your evidence and see that and kind of decide what might be true. Okay. So who pick another one. That well, probably for, for you, one that you would have been aware of growing up is uh, Mary. Well, see, I was going to pick her too. Okay. But so, um, <laughs> I, and I was like, well, I'm a female. So, I mean, yeah, but, but I had, there's, yeah, that was one of the ones Mary, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought that there was some, you wrote some real interesting, um, information about her yeah. right and um and i love that you uh, you did honor her yeah. right as as being as the should. the mother of of christ yeah. but it's interesting how um th how you know throughout history how that was taken yeah. and kind of twisted yeah. you know to this you know the queen of heaven oh, yeah. and, and you know we're not trying to be offensive to right. anyone because we certainly i mean she she is uh definitely one who is beloved uh yes. and and honored revered among women i mean scripture yes. even says blessed yes. yes are you mary yes. right yes. um to be called to, all generations to, yes um so but but it's just interesting though how this has changed over the course of time yeah. so talk about about that yeah well it is interesting and so like Peter for the reasons we were saying where they sort of gain a life of their own in certain denominations and churches there's a lot that is said about Mary and as you point out if you just take scripture it gives us every reason to to think of her as the Blessed Virgin Mary like we don't really use that term as Protestant evangelicals we don't have little statues of the Blessed Virgin but as you said, it, the scripture says, all generations will call you uh, blessed. Mm -hmm. Blessed are the breasts that gave you suck, yes. they say yes. about Jesus' mother. So a, a Christian perspective on Mary is one that honors her and celebrates her and gives her the, the, the um, appropriate honor that she's due. She was godly. She was pious. Maybe she was 12, 13, 14 mm -hmm. when she said yes. Let it be done to me according to your will. She said, mm. I will let God come into my uterus. Yes. Wow. Yeah, that's... <laughs> and so the question yeah. is, can we go with everything that eventually developed in the theology? Yeah, of and, then I, and I want to talk about that, but I want our audience to know that we are 
referring to Brian Litvin's book, um, After Acts, Exploring the Lives and Legends of the Apostles. And that word legend, mm -hmm. and that's a little bit of what we're talking about here as it relates to Mary. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, I, some of what you wrote was, uh, you know, there were folks that said she didn't have any other children. Right, right. Um, you know, that 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 uh, there was perpetual virginity. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so, is that true, right? <laughs> it's a, one of those things that the, uh, the scriptures don't really contradict. It's not very likely in one sense. I know that could be offensive to some viewers because it's very important to say Catholics today to sort of believe in the perpetual virginity. But if you just look at the scriptures, uh, you find that it doesn't contradict it. Even some early Protestants like Martin Luther, he believed in the uh, perpetual virginity. Um, it does, did he? Yeah. I did not it's know that. It's not the really Catholic doctrine. You had John wow. Wesley believing that. Okay. You had Martin Luther believing that. John Calvin said it's certainly possible. We just don't know for sure. So the earliest P Protestant reformers didn't just hammer that point. Uh, Luther himself had a very robust Marian piety. Very, oh. She was very much part of I did of his, not realize right. that. We okay. sometimes don't, do we? So it can be something that we could, many Anglicans today and even conservative Bible-believing uh, Anglicans might respect Mary in certain ways, as we all should. So perpetual virginity, it says in, I think it's Matthew 125, Joseph kept her a virgin until. So the implication is he didn't keep her a virgin after that. And we know that God celebrates sex within marriage. Correct. We know that uh, an ancient Hebrew girl probably who would be married to Joseph, he's probably not going to abstain from sexual relations with his wife. Why would he? Mm -hmm. It would be something beautiful. But why would she why would she even need to be married if she was going to be a perpetual virgin? Right, right. And yet we know that she was from yes, scripture. Right? Absolutely. And so I mean maybe the, well actually some traditions have Joseph as a kind of protector, guardian, more than mm. a husband. Okay. Almost like a father. Oh, okay. Actually, yeah. So they can explain it away yeah. by saying yeah. that. There's yeah. that in terms of her, yeah. So he's her husband, but really sort of like a, an elderly grandfather who just takes care of her until she goes on and lives. So those are traditions. Um, probably he had, he was married to her, she was his wife, and they had relations. Mm -hmm. um, but in the ancient church, a strong emphasis on on virginity and celibacy developed and it just became unthinkable in people's minds that Mary who was the mother of Jesus could have <gasps> sex yeah. it just it yeah. was almost like a little bit of negativity <laughs> towards sex and we're it was just, purer than God is yeah, right exactly. we're holier than I mean, he is right? songs right yeah. I mean God celebrates sexuality yeah. and so there's different views on on Mary's uh, perpetual virginity. Well, what about what about the the um, you know the statement that James uh, so yep. and we, was James a half brother? Yep. Was he a full brother? I mean, right. what about that? Right. Good question, and I, I do have a chapter on James too. So so James then complicates matters because the scripture calls him the brother of the Lord. So you have to figure out how. If Mary's a virgin, even after she gave birth to Jesus, then how is Jesus having a brother? So there's different ways you can either say, well, Joseph had an earlier marriage and he brought in, so it's kind of a stepbrother. Or many Catholics would say today that brother in the ancient Hebrew mm -hmm. way of thinking included cousins. Yeah. So James the brother was really sort of a cousin and so he didn't come from Mary. So you're right, if you want to believe that Mary had perpetual virginity, meaning no sex, meaning no more babies, you have to deal with James, the Lord's brother in the mm -hmm. scriptures. Yeah, but, but, and it's like, where does that, all that evidence come from? Right. Right? I, 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 I mean, I'm just curious, yeah. right? But is, is it legend it, as opposed so th to... So that's what I'm yeah, sifting in here, yeah. because what you get is that, this is why it's called after X. If you just go by like the epistle of James, which maybe gives you some hints or whatever you can determine in the book of Acts. And if you just limit yourself to the Bible, you can only know this much. Mm -hmm. Now that's inspired, so it's going to be true. But if you want to piece together what happened after Acts, you have to use these texts that, like you're right yeah. to call them legends. For example, the text that's about uh, James and Mary 
and it has all kinds of statements about her, even has a midwife who comes and inspects her yes. physically and finds that she still is a virgin and she's still intact. Yeah. I know it's a little <laughs> bit medical there, but um, those, those are texts that usually are legends mm -hmm. and they reflect what the early Christians were believing and passing yeah. on. But there's probably a kernel of truth that's not just legend, but maybe is true there. Yeah. Well, and I guess I wonder, honestly, how important it is for us or how how much does it really matter, right. w you know, whether she was or she wasn't. Yeah. The fact is, is that Jesus, we know, was yeah. immaculately conceived yeah. and that he is God. And um, and I think so, oh. it, our sometimes our human tendencies can cause us to just for whatever reasons, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, maybe we need to put somebody on a pedestal. I, right. I don't know, but to kind of go off on this whole, you know. It can go too far. And I, I think, so, so here again, there's that throwing out the baby with the bathwater thing. You have traditions that I'm very respectful of, but yet I feel have probably gone too far. And like you said, putting on pedestals. Yeah. So then you see people that are very annoyed with elevating ancient saints on pedestals mm -hmm. and they knock over all the pedestals sure. and they leave those good people kind of broken on the ground. Sure. And so is there a way to pick up the pieces yes. because they're inspiring yes. and because they were the first ones to take that baton and pass it to right. the next right. and give us that sense of heritage? And do we as Christians today want to knock over all the saints of the past and just kind of consider them irrelevant yeah. because some people took them too far correct, and prayed correct. to them and stuff. Yes. So do we just throw all that out and say, Christianity is kind of a thing that, you know, makes sense in the past 10 years. Yeah. And it's pretty much my sense of church history goes back to my church being founded sure, a few years ago. Sure. Or do we want to pick up those pieces and say, what can we learn from those first generation, second generation, third generation believers, not praying to them or treating them as saints, mm -hmm. superhuman saints, but honoring their legacy. Right. Uh, honoring as opposed to idolizing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one more that I wanted to talk about um, uh, is uh, John. Yeah. Because <laughs> I thought that one was pretty yeah. fascinating. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. like, did John actually write mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the epistles, mm -hmm. right? And did mm -hmm. he write the gospel? Yeah. Um, and I and I know that you that you also talk about scholarly help yes. that was provided yes. to some of these individuals, and it's interesting because Luke actually uh, was was Luke even a Jew? Luke was a Gentile. He was a Gentile, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I I remember a Cypriot. I remember somebody who was a Cypriot Jew yep. that you referenced. That one was kind of fun for me because my husband and I got married in Cyprus, oh, and it yeah, actually yeah. caused yeah. me to do some other kind of like digging. Yeah. But not. So I think it's good for folks to know that yeah. not all of these individuals were Jews. Right. Um, there were Gentiles that mm -hmm. God used. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I just thought it was John really kind of was. Yeah. And because people said he was boiled in oil yep, and then yep, he was, right. you know, he wrote Revelation. Yep. And so, yeah, talk about him. So, John, um, you're talking about the disciple, the beloved disciple. Um, so what, what do you have that would be the Johannine books in the New Testament? You have 1st, 2nd and 3rd John. You have his gospel where he's not named, but there's this mention of this beloved disciple who reclined on the bosom of Jesus. Yes. Yeah. And there's like nobody left to be that person except the one who's writing it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so like once you see all the other disciples he mentions in there, plus there's this beloved one, yeah. it's like, who is it going to be? So there, there was uh, John the disciple. And, and so then the, the fifth book is the book of Revelation. So the question is not whether Jesus had a disciple that existed and wrote things, because clearly he did. It's whether the gospel is by him whether first, second, and third are by him, and maybe the, the little bit less likely, but I, I think it is, but maybe not, is the book of Revelation. So then the question is, was there a different John? Lots of people are named mm -hmm. John today. Sure, <laughs> And the ancient sure. world too. Sure. So it's not a question of doubting John, it's just saying, is the disciple John, the sons of Zebedee, the same one who wrote this book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. So if it is, then how do you piece that timeline together? Mm -hmm. If it's not, then who was this other person? Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned the other scholars. And so, you know, one of the interesting things about ancient authors, like 
probably your viewers picture me as an author. Like I sat down with a word processor and I wrote everything and I, and I did and you know I kind of wrote this and it became my book. But the word author is the same word as authority. And sometimes somebody else could in the ancient world write a book under the authority mm -hmm. of their master. Mm -hmm. And maybe the master didn't see it until it was written, but gave it his authority mm -hmm. and potentially never even saw it. Can you call them the author? An ancient person would call that person the mm -hmm. author if the disciple mm -hmm. wrote under the authority of somebody else. Yes. So yeah. that's where you get a thing like, did John, is John the author of something? Do we mean the same thing by author that the ancients did? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's really good. Um, <laughs> and I, I guess I wanted to ask the question too about John. So did he write the book of Revelation? What, he, what did I give? I think, let's <laughs> what see. What did you give I, him? Okay, so in my report card, report card B plus. Oh, you gave him a B plus. And I gave, and I gave uh, the fourth gospel an A. Okay. And the three epistles an A. An A, so, okay. So B plus is reflecting Maybe the John who wrote Revelation is a different fellow named John. Yes. But it's a B plus, so I think yes. it's probably the disciple. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the scholars were skilled at, at writing, right. and, and so that also speaks yes. to the fact that some of these individuals were not as learned, right. um, or perhaps they didn't write in that language, yeah. too. Is that, is, could that be another reason? Potentially. I mean, scholars, modern historians debate, for example, would a first century Jew who's a fisherman who would speak Aramaic, which yes. is Jesus's language, as their native tongue, would they have known Greek? And they debate that. So the New Testament's written in Greek, so if the person didn't write Greek, then they needed help. Yeah. And you have different scribes that helped Peter write, or the Apostle Paul, who, mm -hmm. who would either physically do the writing, or yeah. maybe they were skilled. So we, we just assume writing and literacy as being universal in a way that the ancient world, it was harder yes. to get. Yes. It was harder to get the education to read and write. Yeah. And so maybe there was a team. Well, I love the fact that God used different people from mm -hmm. different walks of life. Mm -hmm. you know, Luke, a medical doctor, yep. Peter, a fisherman. Yep. Tax collector, um, and they Matthew. all agreed on who he was. Mm -hmm. um, and all of them were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that's what's, you know, it's very cogent, yeah. you know. Um, so I, I wanted to I wanted to just say again that um, in in these few moments that uh, we're talking to Brian Litfin um, and talking about his book After Acts, exploring the lives and legends of the apostles. It's it, it really is an easy read. It's very comfortable, and there's some really good information in here. Um, I was pretty much able to sit down and go through it in one in one sitting. So um, I want to ask, and you know, as we're as we're kind of winding this down, like, yeah. what do you think is a good step then? Kind of a good next step for readers that want to um, dig more into uh, church history. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, I mean, I mentioned so after Acts. I hope that that is a blessing to your readers. I mean, to your viewers and. And uh, if they're interested in that question, where did the apostles go, that's what it's for. Uh, earlier I mentioned my book, uh, Getting to Know the Church Fathers. And I, I wrote that to take the modern Christian by the hand and say, who, who are the next generation? So it doesn't really deal with the apostles. Uh, it deals with names that probably you've heard, like Irenaeus, Tertullian, mm -hmm. um, Origen, Athanasius. Most people have heard of St. Augustine who wrote the Confessions mm -hmm. and, and even St. Patrick and figures like mm -hmm. that that people have heard of. So some of these early saints, it's not from the time of the Middle Ages or the Reformation. The term Church Fathers is referring to ancient people living in the Roman mm -hmm. Empire. And so if your viewers are interested in getting to know the Church Fathers, I wrote that book and I'll, and I'll give you one more. I wrote a book called Early Christian Martyr Stories. Mm. So earlier you mentioned the persecution of the church. Yes. And so there are these great heroes like Perpetua and Polycarp the Martyr and others who died for their faith. And so I have a book called Early Christian Martyr Stories that is very encouraging because you say, wow, these are people who paid the ultimate price. Mm -hmm. Like Perpetua was a young woman in her early 20s with a nursing baby, and she left behind this world, and she said, I cannot deny Christ. And wow. she was pressured so hard, Barbara, by her, even her father. 
and by the Roman authorities, and they mm. said, deny Christ. And she picked up a little, a little uh, in her jail, she picked up a little water pot. It was a little pot of water, and she said, do you see this? Can this be called something else? Can this be called a flower? Mm. Can this be called a truck? No, this is a water pot. Mm. That's what it's called. And so too, I'm a Christian. I cannot be called by mm. something other than what I am. And if that means I leave this life and my baby and all my friends, so be it. I will stand for Christ. Wow, that is really powerful. Perpetua is a great hero of the ancient church. Well, in closing, I would, I would like to say I, I, at the top of the, the program, I talked about studying to show ourselves approved. And as Christians, I think it's, it's really incumbent upon us to do that, whether it's reading about the church fathers or reading about the martyrs. I mean, these are all things that would encourage us, inspire us, sharpen us. Um, and as believers, we need to know what our history is. Many of us as individuals want to know uh, what our general generations and you know look like what our historical backgrounds were uh, what our generational tree looks like but as believers we should always have a reason for the hope that mm. lies within us mm. and know what this word says we hope that you've enjoyed this program Brian Litfin our guest and his book after acts exploring the lives um, and legends of the apostles God bless you discouraged And why should the shadows come Why should my heart be lonely And long for When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know I sing because I'm happy. Yes, I sing because I'm free. For his eyes are the spirit. Resting on his good.